Dissidents in Zimbabwe have killed more whites in fresh outbreaks of violence. In two separate attacks, dissidents today killed six people and kidnapped two others. A white family and their black security guard were ambushed on the highway between Victoria Falls and Bulawayo. All six were shot dead, among them two children aged two and four. North of Bulawayo, gunmen kidnapped a white farmer in his 70s and his grandson. The kidnappers say they're supporters of the opposition leader, Joshua Nkomo. They're demanding the return of 11 farms belonging to Mr Nkomo and his Zapu party, which were confiscated by the government earlier this year. Britain's Fishery Protection Squadron is on full alert tonight because at midnight the common market's present fishery policy expires. A confrontation is expected with Danish trawlers which are likely to defy a ban on fishing in British waters. Michael Cole reports from the Danish port of Espier. It's Europe's most efficient fishing fleet, or as Scottish fishermen see it, the most ruthless. Only at New Year is the harbour crowded. The rest of the time, the 350 boats are out crisscrossing the North Sea. Virtually all their fishing is done outside their own waters. The smaller vessels take cod, herring and mackerel from around Britain's coasts. The big industrial trawlers scoop up pout and smaller fry to feed the three fish meal plants whose chimneys dominate the harbour. Talk among fishermen this New Year's Eve is only of the uncertain future. When they put back to sea, some are threatening to fish right up to British beaches. They believe that joining the EEC carried with it that understanding. But many are worried about being arrested by Royal Navy and other British patrol boats, as the chairman of their association explained. Of course, the fishermen are very concerned about it. They, they don't want any confrontation. In fact, they want to avoid confrontation with the British Navy. But one must be aware that they also want to practice their, their right, their legal right to fish. Unlike the Icelanders, who had a force of gunboats to try and protect their interests, the Danish men are expecting no support from their navy, as their government is only reluctantly backing their stand. This vessel is just for training weekend reservists. As the deadline draws near, the Danes are determined that their auction hall will be filled by this time next week, with fish from the British, or as they see it, European waters. So as Britain prepares to celebrate the 10th anniversary of its membership of the EEC by squaring up to one of its oldest and closest allies, so Danish fishermen prepare to put to sea to confront British patrol boats and the Royal Navy. The Republic of Ireland's Navy of six ships is also on alert, ready to deal with any attempt by Danish vessels to fish illegally in their waters. The Dublin government wants extra powers from the EEC to cope with trawlers operating inside their territorial limits. They'll put on trial any Danish skipper caught fishing illegally after midnight. The BBC's correspondent in Warsaw, Kevin Ruane, has been told by the Polish authorities that he can no longer report from Poland and must leave the country by next Friday. The authorities said the reason for their action against Ruane, who was assigned to Warsaw last April, was the panorama programme Two Weeks in Winter, broadcast on BBC One earlier this month. A BBC spokesman denied Polish claims that it contained propaganda. The dispute at the Times is over, and the newspaper will appear again on Monday. The electricians who walked out in a row over new equipment have got extra money, four threatened jobs are being retained, and there's to be a review of working agreements in six months. Lord Gowrie, Minister of State for Northern Ireland, said today he'd resign if there was a, a shoot-to-kill policy for security forces in Ulster. But he added that he was worried about recent incidents. In the last two months, seven men have been shot dead by the security forces. When Mrs Thatcher was asked in a New Year interview about reports of a shoot-first policy in Northern Ireland, she dismissed them firmly with one word, rubbish, she said. On the question of a general election, Mrs Thatcher said she wouldn't even start planning for one before May, after the government had been in office for four years. She urged more support for British goods and went on to deal with nuclear disarmament. She told Brian Curtoys that few people were taken in by Labour's view that it should be only on one side. I'm a true disarmer. A true disarmer. That is, I want armaments reduced on both sides. And I want them reduced in such a way that our defences are still sure because they're balanced with those of the potential aggressor. And I want it not only in nuclear, but in conventional as well. 
And that is the line we have taken and will continue to take. Mrs Thatcher, a year ago you said that Britain was through the worst. Now, although inflation has come down, hasn't the position worsened for all those who've lost their jobs last year and for the millions on the poverty line? I think on the whole we rode the storm last year very well, but I would agree with you that unemployment's got worse. It is partly the world situation, partly that we're not getting enough share of our home market, partly that some of the new technologies are taking over. So for those who are unemployed, yes, it is very difficult indeed. But you've seen as the great shopping spree that we've had at the end of this year, that means there is demand, and I just hope that sufficient number of people are buying a goodly proportion of British goods. Do you see any sign of unemployment coming down next year, or are you prepared to fight a general election with unemployment at record levels? I don't think any of us can conjure up jobs out of thin air. You can only conjure up jobs by having satisfied customers. That is a long process. It's something which is afflicting us the world over. So I really haven't a great deal of choice except to create the kind of conditions in which new jobs can be created. The opposition leader, Michael Foote, in his New Year message, has said Labour's task for 1983 is to show that it has a civilised and constructive alternative to what he called the Thatcherite cutthroat society. Mr Foote said that more than six million people were living on the poverty line. For them, Thatcherism meant sheer stark poverty on a scale unknown for nearly half a century. Canon John Collins, a founder member of the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament and Canon of St Paul's for 33 years, has died of a heart attack. He was 77. Canon Collins, a controversial churchman, joined the Labour Party after the war and helped launch CND in 1958. He was a leading figure in the big protest marches between Aldermaston and London, and in 1961 he was one of more than a thousand people arrested at an anti-nuclear demonstration in Trafalgar Square. After his resignation from CND, he still campaigned vigorously for socialist policies. He said the question for Christians was not whether they should become involved in politics, but how. Hundreds of demonstrators gathered outside the American air base at Upper Hayford in Oxfordshire today in another protest against nuclear weapons. The base is home for 71 F-111 nuclear bombers. The uh, demonstrators formed human blockades at every gate in what they called a peace chain. Police stood by in case of trouble, but there was no repeat of the disturbances at Greenham Common Air Base. An RAF Phantom pilot and his navigator are facing court-martial in West Germany next month after the shooting down of an RAF Jaguar jet during a training exercise. The jet was hit by a Sidewinder missile and crashed, although the pilot ejected safely. Flight Lieutenants Roy Lawrence and Alistair Inverarity face charges of negligence, which they deny. And the story of Mrs Ethel Ferguson, an 82-year-old woman with a broken hip who's been flown from the Falklands to an English hospital for an operation. The cottage hospital in Port Stanley, where Mrs Ferguson was taken after a fall, was unable to cope. The problem of treating such acute cases on the islands is a serious one. Before the fighting, she would have gone to Argentina, but now the only way patients can receive advanced medical care is to fly 8,000 miles to Britain. When the Royal Air Force transport touched down at Bryce Norton tonight, an ambulance was waiting for Mrs Ferguson. She'd set off from the Falklands yesterday afternoon in the back of a Hercules cargo aircraft to Ascension Island. Then there was a change to a VC-10 for a further 10-hour flight to England. Argentine footballer Osvaldo Ardiles rejoins his Spurs teammates in a training session eight months after leaving Britain because of the Falklands crisis. It's expected he'll be back in the Spurs team in time for the third round of the FA Cup a week tomorrow. He says he's always wanted to return to British football, but he's still worried about the possibility of a hostile reception from some British fans. And that's the news for another year, and my last as a television newsreader. And so, after 28 years, I'm going to uh, say goodbye to you from this particular chair, although I very much hope to meet you again in uh, various other programmes. Uh, on behalf of all of us here in the newsroom, a very happy new year to you all. It's the real stuff. Isn't it? Very nice too.